So welcome back, and I want to congratulate you on the orderly photo behavior. So that's, I'm really impressed. I think it was, uh, went very smoothly. So we will distribute to everyone those photographs and also photographs of the, that uh, RORA has been taking during the, uh, the conference. Um, and um, there, there will be uh, videotapes available on the Niels Bohr Professorship site in, in a few weeks' time from this. OK, so we've heard uh, a lot about GBD, um, about uh, what's happening in Norway, how the WHO can use the, the estimates for um, the SDG. And now we're going to a topic that has been keeping um, my, my colleagues and I very, very busy. Uh, it's comorbidity. Comorbidity within mental disorders, comorbidity between mental disorders and general medical conditions, or what's sometimes called somatic disorders, and also the structure of mental disorders. And uh, we have um, speakers from uh, the Netherlands, from Australia, and from Denmark. And the first speaker is my colleague and postdoc, Oliver Plana Ripoll. Olga is a very talented young man. I see great things for this guy. Pressure. <laughs> he comes from a, um, a very well qualified in maths and biostatistics uh, from the University of PhD here at Aarhus University in the building next door. Uh, that way, public health. And he joined um, the Niels Bohr team just about 14 months ago. So he's, uh, he's been on a very steep learning curve, learning about me mental illness. And um, we, uh, Niels Bohr, we've got an opportunity to do some big things. And uh, Olga has, uh, has been uh, in charge of an extremely big project. So um, this is the, uh, we presented this at uh, Florence at the International Schizophrenia Meeting. And this is the first time that uh, the data have been presented to um, our Danish colleagues. So, Olga, please join us now and tell us about comorbidity within mental disorders. Well, thanks. Is this working? Yeah. Thanks for this presentation. And as John said, I'm a postdoc. Um, I'm part of the Niels Bohr uh, professorship project. So for me, I mean, I'm very excited to present this in the Niels Bohr Professorship uh, Symposium. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, mental health comorbidity, and this is the first study of, uh, of my postdoc. And how do we define uh, comorbidity? Comorbidity is the presence of one or more disorders in relation to an index disorder. So today we have seen how important mental disorders is, how prevalent anxiety and depression um, are, and now we're going to see combinations of of, of disorders which are also very important. Um, we know from population-based surveys that around one every four persons will meet the criteria for two or more mental disorders uh, during their lifetime. So comorbidity, it's also important, not the mental disorder, like each mental disorder um, individually. But we can look at it from another perspective among all those who are diagnosed with a mental disorder around half of them will, um, will, will receive another mental, or will suffer another mental disorder uh, during their lifetime. These results are from population-based surveys, which has been a really rich uh, source for psychiatric epidemiology, but they also have some potential limitations. Um, they are based on those persons alive at the time of the survey and also willing to participate. So there are some potential problems of selection bias, uh, usually self-reported data or interviews, I mean, there, there could be some, some recall bias. Um, so register-based studies are a very good complement to findings from, from surveys. And there are many different uh, register-based uh, studies talking about comorbidity within mental disorders, but I decided to just cite uh, two of them from some of our colleagues in the, in the National Center for, for Register-Based Research that they estimated that among all those with a mental disorder during adolescence, around 9% of them will develop a schizophrenia within eight years. And they also found that, that depression is more common among those who have a mental disorder during adolescence uh, compared to the general Danish uh, population. And as I said, register-based studies are a very good complement from, to findings from surveys but usually they are restricted to a subset of disorders or they use different methodologies, different populations. So the results from different studies are, are difficult to compare. 
So the aim of, of the study that I'm presenting today was to investigate mental health comorbidity, including a comprehensive range of disorders uh, using registers. And we wanted to, to use the same population and the same methodology for all combinations of, of disorders, which will make it easy to compare results for different uh, disorders. More specifically, we wanted to, to provide, to, to estimate, temporally ordered age and sex-specific pairwise estimates between major groups of mental disorders. Um, age and sex-specific, everyone knows what this is. Temporally ordered means that we're interested first in those who get depression and what is the risk of getting anxiety, but also those who first get anxiety and what is the risk of, of uh, getting depression. And then these are a lot of results, uh, and this is the area of, of big data. So we wanted also to develop an interactive website to, to visualize all these results. Um, of course, we are planning also to publish this, and we will have to limit to five or six tables or, or figures, but we think that, that this amount of, of results need a more uh, modern way to, to be given to the, to, research, to the research community and also to the general um, community. For, I guess that most of you are familiar with Danish registers, but I also know that there are some people from abroad who might be not that familiar, so I'm just going to give a very short introduction to Danish registers. Uh, this is Denmark, and in Denmark, everyone at birth or at immigration receives a, a unique personal identification number, the CPR. And this number can be used to obtain information from many different uh, registers. Um, it's, it's amazing the amount of information available thanks to this uh, personal identification number, and it's a, it's a big privilege to be able to use this data for, for research, but it's also important to, to mention that we always did treat data in an anonymous way and according to rules and, and ethical uh, guidelines. But thanks to this personal identification number, uh, we were able to identify everyone who was living in Denmark between years 2000 and 2016, which was around 6 million uh, individuals. And then we used the CPR number, this personal identifica identification number, to obtain information from the Danish psychiatric uh, register. And let me talk a little bit about the, the Danish psychiatric register. This register, register is available since 1969, and it includes all admissions to psychiatric inpatient facilities, and also after 1995, uh, outpatient uh, psychiatric departments and emergency visits. So everyone who is living in Denmark and goes to one of these psychiatric hospitals uh, will be registered in this register with the date of the administrative date of onset and the diagnosis of of interest. As you can assume, this is, this is a little bit complicated because some individuals will appear in this register only once, some individuals will appear in the register more than one time for the same disorder, and some others will appear more than one time for different disorders, and actually this is why we are interested in comorbidity because there are uh, some of them, but to try to make things simpler, at least for this uh, first study, we decided to group all mental uh, diagnoses into these 10 main groups. And I don't expect you to follow closely all this table, but the main message is that, that, that we, are, um, we are dividing all mental disorders into these 10 main groups. From now on, on I will uh, talk about these 10 groups. And, but this classification is nothing that we made up. These are subchapters from the ICD um, classification codes. And so we have these 10 groups of major mental disorders. And again, to make things a little bit simple for, for this first study, we decided to investigate pairs of disorders. So each of these disorders is compared to the other uh, nine disorders. So we have 10 groups times nine other groups. We have 90 pairs. These are a lot of estimates. Some of them are extremely interesting, and I would love to share all of them with you but I don't think I will have time today to, to go in detail with, with everything. So I will focus uh, a little bit on, on the group of mood disorders, which well, it's a quite common disorder. It includes uh, depression. But at the end of the talk, I will introduce this website that, 
that we are developing and the user can go to see uh, a specific disorders of, of interest. But first, let's talk a little bit about the, the methods, very briefly. Um, this is a population-based cohort study and it includes, as I said, 6 million individuals who were living in Denmark between years 2000 and 2016. And for each pair of disorders, there was a, a prior disorder and a later disorder. So, as I said, the association between a pair of disorders is estimated in, in both ways. And then for, for each specific disorder, let's think about schizophrenia. Uh, Follow-up started in the year uh, 2000. And we used all the available time in the registers before the beginning of the follow-up as a washout period. If someone had a diagnosis of schizophrenia, as example, during this period, this person was excluded from the analysis. Because at the beginning of the follow-up, we needed all individuals to be at risk of being diagnosed with schizophrenia. So those who had a diagnosis before were excluded from the analysis. And then follow-up ended at the at the onset of the disorder, or death, emigration, or at the end of 2016. So, the longest individual follow-up was 17 years. But if we sum up all individual follow-ups, we have around 84 uh, million person years of follow-up. So, these settings are based on, on the later disorder. I gave the example of schizophrenia, but we need to investigate associations between prior disorders and later disorders. So all other nine disorders were treated as time-varying exposures. Um, let's continue with the example of schizophrenia. If we wanted to investigate the association between substance use disorders and schizophrenia, if someone never had a diagnosis of substance use disorder, as would be person A, this person is considered unexposed to substance use disorders during the, fo the entire follow-up time. Then there is the case that someone could have been diagnosed with substance use disorders before the beginning of the follow-up. This person will be considered exposed to substance use disorders during the entire follow-up. And finally, there is the third case that someone, like person C, at the beginning of the follow-up has never received a diagnosis of substance use disorders before. This person is considered unexposed but at some point during the, the follow-up time, he or she receives a diagnosis of substance use disorders, and at that point, this person becomes exposed. So we have a group of exposed and unexposed to each of the prior disorders, and we want, we want to investigate the rates of a later disorder. And we used Cox proportional hazards models. We estimated two different models. Uh, model A, adjusted for age, sex, and calendar time, and model B was a little bit more conservative and also adjusted for other mental health comorbidity. We had 10 groups of disorders, and in each analysis, one disorder is the prior disorder and one is the later disorder, so the, the other eight are used to adjust for, for mental health uh, comorbidity. As I said, this is a little bit more conservative. Today I'm going to show only results of, of model B, but in this interactive website, all results uh, are going to be available. This was a little bit about the, the methods. Maybe it was a little bit difficult to, to follow. If someone get, got lost, now we're going to talk ab about results, which is the most interesting part of, of, the, of the presentation. So now it's time to engage again with the, with the presentation. <laughs> these, are the, these are the specific results for mood disorders. Um, I'm going to show you a little bit how to interpret these figures, because there are a lot of figures. But basically, these estimates here are the hazard ratios of being diagnosed with each of these disorders, depending on whether individuals have a previous diagnosis of mood disorder uh, or not. And the first thing we can see is that being diagnosed with a mood disorder increases the probability of being diagnosed with all other uh, nine disorders. And this is the example for, for mood disorders, but we can go and see the, the big picture here we have, again, mood disorders here that this is what we just saw in a larger scale. But these are uh, all, the, all the 90 estimates, all pairs of disorders classified depending on the 10 prior disorders. And what we can see is that almost all associations are uh, positive. So being diagnosed with one mental disorder 
increases the risk of almost all other, uh, the risk of being diagnosed with almost all other mental disorders. But let's go back to the example of, of mood disorders, because as I said, there are so many results, so we need to focus on something to show you as example, and then in the website, everything is going to be um, available. We can focus now on the pair mood disorders and neurotic disorders. Uh, neurotic disorders include diagnosis such as anxiety, and mood disorders and anxiety um, are particularly interesting. They are usually uh, correlated, so I'm going to show you some of, of these results. The main estimate, we have a hazard ratio of 10.5. The confidence interval is quite narrow. Actually, we cannot even see it uh, in, the, in the figure. But what this means is that those who receive a diagnosis of mood disorders have around 10 times higher probability of, of being diagnosed with neurotic disorders compares, compared to those who don't have a diagnosis of mood disorders. And this is just one of these 90 estimates, but now I'm going to show you how we interrogated uh, this data or, or this estimate. Uh, just as an as example, looking at the paired mood and neurotic disorders. First, we could estimate uh, sex-specific hazard ratios. And for this specific pair, we observed that the hazard ratio for males was slightly larger than, than for females. And then we were wondering if this estimate changed depending on the time since the diagnosis of mood disorders. So the, 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 the hazard ratio of being diagnosed with a neurotic disorders is already 10 the week after receiving a diagnosis of mood disorders, and is it still 10, 15 years later? Well, the answer is no. And in this figure, we are showing the results depending on the time since a diagnosis of mood disorders. We have a uh, Males in blue, which over the entire follow-up period are slightly higher than, than females in, in yellow. And what we can see is in the first six months after receiving a diagnosis of mood disorders, the probability or the risk of receiving a diagnosis of neurotic disorders is around 80 to, uh, 80 to 100 times higher compared to those who don't have a mood disorder diagnosis. This is ridiculous. I mean, a hazard ratio of 100 it's, well, it's very large. But then, as, as, this, as time goes by, this association diminished, but even 15 years after the diagnosis of mood disorder, those who had a diagnosis of mood disorder are still at a higher risk of receiving a diagnosis for the first time of neurotic disorders compared to those who didn't have a diagnosis of, uh, of mood disorders. And this, these are relative risks. We are comparing those with a mood disorder to those without a mood disorder. But we can also look at the, at, the, at the absolute risks. We can focus on all those who receive a diagnosis of mood disorder for the first time and follow them uh, over time. And what we can see is at the beginning, just at the same time that they receive a mood disorder or shortly after, around 11 to 12% of them will also receive uh, a neurotic disorder. So these two disorders co-occur at, at the same time for a, for a large proportion of, of individuals, which goes in line with these higher estimates just after the diagnosis of, of mood disorder. But then as time goes by, these uh, absolute risks continue to increase, and 15 years after the first diagnosis of mood disorder, around 30% uh, of men and 32-33% of women will have developed a neurotic disorder. This is a very large uh, proportion. It's one out of three who will be diagnosed with a neurotic disorder after a diagnosis of mood disorder within 15 years. But these are all persons of all ages. Uh, we are not considering at what age these individuals receive the, the first diagnosis of mood disorder. But we also investigated age stratified um, estimates. And what we observed is that for those who receive a diagnosis of, of mood disorders before the age of 20, the absolute risks are much larger than comparing to older ages. Within 15 years, 50% of women and 40% of men will also be diagnosed uh, 
with a, with a neurotic uh, disorder. And this, this was a little bit some examples of how we can inter interrogate this single estimate and then look into, into more detail. But it's also important how we show uh, this data. For example, in, in this, we like this figure because we can investigate uh, symmetry. In the left side of the, of the figure, we have the hazard ratios from mood disorders to all other uh, nine disorders. And in the, for example, the, the neurotic disorders one, this, these are the ones that we have been looking through the, the presentation. But then in, in the right side, we have all estimates the other way around, the association from all of the nine disorders to mood disorders. And first, what we can see is that, that, that the associations are like positive in both directions. So being diagnosed with a mood disorder increases the risk of all other disorders, but being di diagnosed with all other disorders increases the risk of diagnosis of, of mood disorders. But some associations are very symmetrical. For example, for the pair mood neurotic disorders, we see similar estimates. It seems that that the, the hazard ratio from mood to neurotics is very similar than the hazard ratio from neurotic to, to mood disorders. However, other pairs, such as mood disorders and schizophrenia, they, have, they are not symmetrical at all. The association is stronger in one direction than, than in the other, which can indicate different ages of, of, of onset. Or it, I mean, it has different explanations. And these are the, the overall hazard ratios for men and women. But we can also investigate the symmetry of the associations, taking into consideration the time since the first diagnosis. Um, there is a lot of data here, but I'm going to explain a little bit. Uh, here we have the results for men and women separately, and here it's persons uh, all together, otherwise we would have too many lines. But on the website, you can go and see the specific for men or for, for women. And here we have in red, um, the hazard ratios from mood disorders to all other disorders, depending on the time since a diagnosis of mood disorder. And in blue, we have the hazard ratio from all other disorders to mood disorders, also depending on the time since this diagnosis of other disorders, not mood. And again, ne mood neurotic, which was quite symmetric, we see here that it's actually very symmetric. Like, it's, it's not only the overall hazard ratio, which is very similar, but it's also considering time. 15 years after receiving a mood disorder, the hazard ratio of receiving a neurotic disorder, it's very similar than 15 years after receiving a neurotic disorder, the hazard ratio of receiving a, a mood disorder. It's difficult to explain all this, but, but it's amazing to see that there is basically one line. But again, for some other disorders, such as schizophrenia, uh, the estimates are, are different over the entire um, time since the first uh, disorder. And these were some examples for some specific disorders, but as I said, we are developing a, an interactive web page that I'm going to show you a little bit uh, today. Here, for example, we have the 10 groups of disorders, and the size of the bubble depends on the number of cases that we observe uh, during the follow-up time. Uh, we plan this to be very interactive. The user can go and see specifically which diagnoses are included uh, in each of these groups of, of, of measure disorders. And if we see a, a, a little bit of the, of, the, um, of the results, the user can go and see which disorders are associated with which other disorders, which basically all of them are associated with, with all, of the, all of them. Everything will be very interactive. Uh, they can choose to see only men, only women, or, or overall. Here in the plus sign, you can choose the different kind of statistical model. We have the hazard ratio, uh, a heat map with the 90 um, estimates. We also have these uh, symmetry plots that I was showing before. This is the example for mood disorder, but the user can choose and select uh, schizophrenia, and then the plot for schizophrenia appears. So. As I, as I was saying, we plan to make this, like all the, this data available, and the user can go and see the specific uh, interesting ones. We have the lagged hazard ratios depending on the time since the prior disorder, and also the absolute uh, risks. The ones I showed you before were separately for men and women, 
these are for both uh, sexes combined. I learned yesterday that I cannot say persons because apparently this is not well defined. So these are males and females uh, combined. And if the user clicks into a specific estimate, then it's possible to see the, the age um, specific estimates. This is just an example of how this website is going to be. Uh, actually, this website was developed by Jan Holtz. Uh, Jan is giving a talk tomorrow and he's very good. So I really recommend you to, to attend this talk tomorrow where, we, where, where he will talk a little bit more about data visualization and how to have, like, how can we have a more impact uh, research uh, results. But I would like to finish uh, with some conclusions. First, we want to present a comprehensive atlas of pairwise comorbidity. We call it atlas because we would like the user to go and see the specific results that they are uh, interested on. And we saw that comorbidity is pervasive. Um, apparently, being diagnosed with one a mental disorder increases the, the probability of being diagnosed with all other mental disorders. We also saw that comorbid, comorbidity is bidirectional. Not only A increases B, but also B increases A. We saw that some pairs are more symmetrical than, than others, but overall, uh, comorbidity is bidirectional. We also saw that some associations persist even 15 years after the, the prior disorder. And we also observed that some absolute risks are extremely high and may have some clinical utility. We saw the specific example for the paired mood and neurotic disorders. We saw that those who are diagnosed with a mood disorder before the age of 20, around half of them will also develop a neurotic disorders uh, within 15 years. So for this specific pair, it's showing that this group of people is uh, particularly interested uh, earlier today, we were talking about, about head space in Australia and also in other countries such as, such as Denmark that focus on, on young people. So I think that this is a, a good example. And actually, we would like uh, these results to help better identify uh, persons at high risk of, of comorbid uh, disorders. And I would also like to talk a little bit about some limitations of this study, but perspective uh, for future work. We investigated pairs of main groups of disorders. And we are planning to explore uh, other types of comorbidity, not only pairs, but groups of three disorders, groups of four disorders, look at traje trajectories, look at the time since one disorder uh, to the other. And we also plan to investigate some specific types of disorders. We use these 10 groups of major disorders, and the group of mood disorders is a very big group, and it includes uh, bipolar disorders and depression. Maybe it would be interesting to see this particularly uh, diagnosis uh, separately. Also, we could only investigate uh, mental disorders that appeared in the psychiatric register, which means those who were treated in, in, in hospitals, but we are missing those who were treated by the GP and those who don't who don't seek help at all. Um, and also the patterns of comorbidity may be different in, in, in different countries. So we are planning to undertake a, a similar study using data from the World Mental Health uh, Survey, which is a community-based survey from more than 30 uh, countries. And finally, I would like to thank some of the co-authors of this study, John, the, the Niels Bohr professorship, and some other uh, colleagues sorry, the Niels Bohr professor, and some other colleagues at the National Center for Register-Based Research, and Jan, who, who developed uh, this website, and August University and the Danish National Research Foundation for, for funding this project, and thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to, to answer them. I think you can see there's a lot of work here. There's a lot of work. Congratulations, Oliver. You are a very talented scientist, and um, we couldn't have done it without his skills. He's very fast as well. He's incredibly fast. Questions for Oliver? Yes, please. The the website, is it, is it yes, oh, wait, wait. wait. <laughs> oh, uh, it looks really interesting, all of these graphs. Uh, is the website, is it launched? Uh, not yet. Um, I mean, it's, it's almost ready. Um, 
we're planning to first uh, publish a paper, and once the paper is published, we're planning to, to launch the website. Question about, sorry. The, the question about um, duration. So um, are we assuming that once they've had a diagnosis, they still have that diagnosis, or are we assuming that they had the diagnosis, but they could have uh, gone into remission? So um, we have uh, information from registers, the information on um, starting or I like the, the initial uh, date is very accurate. So what, and this is a limitation of the study, we assume that once someone has uh, a diagnosis of depression, this person has depression forever. Um, so we don't have any um, information on remission, but also when investigating like Okay, we compare those with the diagnosis of depression to those without a de diagnosis of depression. Maybe the fact that they recover is not that interesting for, theirs, for this first analysis. Of course, it would be very interesting to see those who have a long um, time disease compared to those who have a short time disease. But for, for these estimates, I don't think that this will cause a, a big bias. One of the problems about the, um, <clears throat> the registers is we've got very good data of first administrative onset, like when they first were identified, but very poor data or no data on offset. And, uh, but Peter, we might be able to look at some of these measures in the World Mental Health Survey. So you can look at whether someone had a persistent course or whether they had symptoms in the last year as a proxy for... See whether that... Uh, but we've got Vera next and then Anne Christian. Thanks, Oligar and John. Um, I said this at the SERS conference, um, but I'd like to repeat this here in front of um, John's um, um, Scandinavian colleagues. John, you've sort of always been really generous with the, the data that you've produced and offered it to researchers around the world. And this is just another example of you doing this. I think it's a, it's a really valiant effort and I think that's that kind of research generosity is rare and ought to be sort of commended. So thank you very much for that. <laughs> I think everyone should put this type of data in the public domain. We want people, we want people to use it. Uh, thank you, Oliver. This was very, very impressive and uh, very interesting. Um, what do you know about the validity of the diagnosis? Could some of these cases be that they changed the diagnosis because they got the more correct diagnosis, or uh, are there really different diseases? So that, that's a very that's a very good question. Uh, there are some studies that validated some uh, of the diagnosis in in Danish registers, and so that's that's one thing. So there are some uh, validation studies, and they found uh, to be quite good. And then we also discussed what, what does it mean, like these persons that have like one disorder and the week after has another disorder. Someone mentioned, oh, maybe doctors in Denmark, in Denmark are not very good at diagnosing and so on. We don't think that this is the case. Actually, we think that this might be a good um, proxy of good clinical practice. Like someone comes with a diagnosis and, sorry, someone comes, receives a diagnosis and a week uh, weeks later, uh, they decide to give this person another diagnosis. In, in this study, this person would have the two diagnoses. We are not making any kind of clean cleaning, like, okay, you receive this diagnosis, one week later you receive another one, this eliminates the first one, we are not doing this. So, so this would show up in the, in the study. Thanks, going to Peter. Um, this issue about uh, uh, is it doesn't reflect bad doctors. I get very defensive about that. It reflects good doctoring. And it's, it's, it's ridiculous and pseudo-sophisticated to suggest that someone can make an accurate diagnosis on the first admission. And that's why we have places like Headspace. And uh, people like Moretta and Pat Pagore are introduce, introducing the term of pluripotent phase, it's like, like a stem cell, where you don't know what direction this individual is going to take. They're probably going to get well, but some of them will go down various tracks. And what Oligar has shown you is what actually happens. There's no gold, there is no gold standard here. This is just what Danish doctors do. And they're doing good practice because they're changing the diagnosis, they're updating it. But the bottom line is if you have one disorder, 15 years later, you're at risk of other ones as well. So, Peter. Well, John, you know what question I'm going to ask, which is, uh, I don't know whether it's for either of you, which is, uh, you know, these are very interesting observations and I wonder 
how much uh, of the observations you have could be explained by underlying uh, genetics, for including the symmetry and the asymmetry. So if I'm not mistaken, but as others in the audience know better than, than I do, but the genetic correlation, for example, between neuroticism and depression is pretty high, and you see the strongest uh, 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 symmetry there. So, first, maybe first I can answer, and then he can compliment. <laughs> but, 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 but basically, at, we are not making any causal statement at any point. We are not saying that being diagnosed with depression causally increases your risk of being diagnosed with other things. So it's, it's obvious that there might be some underlying factors affecting uh, both, uh, pairs, both disorders in, in the pair. There is a lot of research on, on internalizing, externalizing factors. Uh, Peter de Jong here will talk a little bit about this uh, just after me. And, but, but we also know that, that that disorders between the internalizing dimension and externalizing are also correlated. So we wanted to, to show this comprehensive uh, map of, of associations, but, but it's obvious that there might be other factors affecting the likelihood of being diagnosed at the same time. I, I, I think that um, we, we've discussed this in the, in the publication that's under review now. I think this is, uh, this is screaming out, the message is screaming out that there are underlying vulnerabilities which will be heritable, almost certainly genetic. And for, for the example that Oligar focused on about mood disorder and anxiety disorder, it's like stochastic. It doesn't really matter which one you get first. You're going to have the risk of the other one as well. And um, so just as, as uh, the genetics is showing uh, shared variance in polygene risk scores, we, we feel these measures of observed phenotypic correlation can be used to constrain some of the genetic models. But, um, but I particularly want to ask Naomi um, whether you have any comment about, uh, uh, maybe summarise for the audience what, what the general thinking is about shared genetic variants amongst mental disorders, Naomi. Um, well, this is preempting my talk tomorrow, but yes, uh, there is a very high degree of sharing of genetic variants between mental disorders. So. Yes, but I wanted to ask a question since I had the microphone, and that was really about what, what you're thinking about for follow-up analyses. I'm thinking particularly about the hazard ratios and are there other covariates that one would include? I was thinking, for example, socioeconomic status, how that might impact on those trajectories. Um, we discussed about uh, including also socioeconomic status in, in, the, in this analysis. The, the, the design of the study is a little bit complex because we have uh, very good data, but we don't have data for everyone for all their lives. So we have a, this 17 year uh, follow up period. So some individuals are at, at one specific age, some others are at, uh, are at another age. And from the registers, we have data on income and education and other socioeconomic characteristics, but it was quite difficult to include this information in, in, in this uh, first study. Um, as I said, we are planning to, to investigate also more complex types of comorbidity, um, actually in a more descriptive way, and in, in this study we are planning to, to also see the correlates between social demographic characteristics and, and combinations of mental disorders. I mean, that will be more in the space of if you have exactly one, exactly two, exactly three, what, what the demographic correlates are. And I think that it, it, there's a, there are also questions related to do socio demographic variables drive you down to, to get the disease too. And this is the second disease, or the later disease we call it, um, um, this gets into this question of this, the primary prevention of secondary comorbidity. So, for example, if someone comes in with a de depression, then you know that they have an increased risk of substance use coming up. And we can quantify that by age and sex and everything. And then the doctor can say, well, I need to monitor substance use and do something prophylactic to reduce the chance of this person going on to get that second disorder. Now, and now there are some things that can be modified through those interventions, but just because we don't have active interventions now, we, we feel we, we need to quantify that. Um, so I think, and then also the polygene risk score. So if you start on depression and then go to anxiety or vice versa, do, do certain polygene risk scores uh, predict one, one direction versus the other? So we, what we're thinking of doing is having a uh, sets of disorder where it doesn't matter which one you get first. You've got these two, you've got these three, and th there's the set, and then we'll uh, build uh, polygen risk scores for that set, uh, cross-tray. 
uh, and then uh, we, we can explore um, factors that, that cause um, that, that order. For one thing, if we could do symmetry, do bivariate GCTA to see whether A leads to B or B leads to A, how much do they share? Oh, they're exactly the same in GCTA. Then we can go back and forth, back and forth between genetics and epidemiology based on the estimates that, uh, that Oliver. I'm very excited about this project. It's going to take uh, many, many years. Harvey? Over time already, but this is obviously very interesting and fascinating. Are we over time? Um, so, because um, I think the, the, the thing, that other thing that comes up when you see that is, um, is there such a thing as um, a discrete anxiety disorder and a discrete mood disorder? Like um, the classificated, you know, systems that we use are, you know, historic, they've been challenged by NIMH through the research uh, domain criteria. Um, and, and, and maybe that those, as you say, those external manifestations that change over time are, are simply um, manifestations of the same disorder. Um, and so this might have a big impact on, you know, psychiatric classification going forward. That I think we're going to stay out. We're our, um, Peter, will you talk about that in your talk? Um, our, our attitude is that we, we're the reporter, okay? We're reporting to you what really happens in Denmark. And then we hope that, that, that this evidence will, be, uh, uh, will go into the matrix to help get better uh, genetic targets, better uh, diagnostic targets. Um, but we're not dictating or, or pontificating what we think is best. We're just, here's the data, process it, and then build new hypotheses based on, on, on what you see here. So are there any other questions before we... Okay, please join me and thank Oligar very much.